Connie, I heard the Big Bang Theory got renewed for a seventh season and they're looking for a new jingle. Uh, <laughs> you might be able to sell something and actually pay for some of that uh, broadband up there. Well, I hope I get it right this time, so I'm going <laughs> to move back to uh, XD applications. <laughs> Have I got it right? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> At least I'm consistent. <laughs> So we're going to move to high performance research applications. Right. Okay, exploratory and bay observatory wired. Okay, so I'm going to uh, uh, introduce, let's see, uh, Rob, you're going to? Yeah. Rob Rothfarb is the online project director at the Exploratorium. His background includes experience in software development, computer graphics, interactual design, and digital video. And Ron, are you going to speak as well? I will, second though. Second? Always. So uh, it in reverse order. I am. Yeah, very, as usual. <laughs> That's okay. Just, just don't worry about it. It's okay. Ron's currently responsible for the Exploratorium's web streaming media and digital asset management servers. And oh. Mary. <laughs> I'm the project director for Wired Pure. And, uh, and for some reason, my thing is so wrong. <laughs> you're, you're left out entirely. <laughs> uh -oh. I'm also the uh, director for uh, science partnerships at the museum. So our, our big partnerships with NOAA and UC Davis and CNIC are part of what I do. So Great. And I apologize that you had to introduce okay. yourself. but I know. I another think, slug, too. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> what can I say? That slug's united. Well, with that, I better get out of here. <laughs> Some people know what they're doing. You should tell them what you meant by saying it's all a slug. You all know that uh, UC Santa Cruz mascot is the banana slug, right? Yes. And I, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, my education was uh, from UCSC, and I, I teach in the science communication program there, so I'm a longtime slug. Very proud of it. And then our, our first presenter was actually from Santa Cruz as well, so it shows you really good things can happen. <laughs> Despite the fact that people call you sluts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, and actually, what, what the, I think the student body after I left as an undergraduate um, rose up in protest because the chancellor wanted to, thought banana slugs was not a very good mascot, not very dignified, wanted to change it to the sea lions. The student body rose up and said, absolutely not. We're proud of our big banana slugs that kind of you step over them as you're walking from classroom to classroom because we're in a beautiful redwood forest. Um, so I want to just, uh, for the team, say that we're really thrilled to get this award by Scenic for our work. Um, the Exploratorium has always appreciated being part of this community. We're a public learning institution, but, uh, but we've uh, worked with Scenic both to do some of the uh, webcasting work that we are um, probably not going to talk about too much, um, but also sort of connecting with research institutions and partners. Um, you may be wondering why a museum is getting a high-performance research application award. I'm not going to tell that. I'm going to let Ron and, and Rob talk about that. And what I'm going to do is sort of provide some of the big picture uh, rationale for the YOP and, and the work that we're doing down at the waterfront. Uh, so you may know that the Exploratorium, this is not a picture of the old Exploratorium, but it's housed for 40-something um, years in a beautiful historic building in the Marina District. It was a beautiful building on the outside and on the inside, but it didn't provide much of a view. It was like a cave. Um, so we really specialized uh, early on in phenomena that you could reproduce on a tabletop. Electricity, magnetism, um, human perception, those, those uh, sorts of really great physics um, is what we're known for, interactive hands-on. Um, and uh, uh, we, we didn't really have that ability to even go outside very much, so we started to work on the web. We were one of the first 600 websites. Um, Ron uh, was instrumental in getting us on the World Wide Web and giving us our EDU designation, which is unusual for a non-degree granting institution. Um, we got our first hit on December 15th uh, in 1993, which is a little bit of web history. Started doing web casting itself from distant locations, um, eclipses and things in the uh, early 2000s, and we've done worldwide lots of eclipses from great places like, or lots of webcasts from places like Antarctica, Greenland, Aruba, Africa, China, uh, the top of Mauna Loa, um, and also connected just with Stanford down the street from us when they were doing an experiment looking at an ancient uh, manuscript of Archimedes uh, using synchrotron radiation. We were able to watch as they were revealing letters on that ancient manuscript, which was really exciting. 
So when we learned that we were going to move to a pier in San Francisco waterfront, we knew we had this tremendous opportunity to actually explore natural phenomena in the world. Um, and and we, uh, we, I want to assure everybody we still have, if you haven't been to our new location, we still do have our traditional exhibits that we brought with us, but we have now started working in, uh, uh, in, in new domains. So uh, I wanted just to tell you, oh, we're not quite, okay. So it's not moving, so maybe it's not done yet. Okay. Do -do -do. Ron? <laughs> Funny it worked this morning. What's that? It says jump to slide. Should I go? Press go. Okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, so this uh, our work in the wire pier is housed in a, a gallery called the observatory, and this is sort of a conceptual uh, drawing of the observatory. What we it's it's a glass building at the end of the piers. It has views of the city and views of the bay, and we're really trying to use the things that people see out the window and give them tools to really observe it. So the uh, that th the idea around the observatory is that we're we're both uh, observers ourselves, but encouraging that in in our um, uh, in our audiences that come. Um, so this is also a great location for us to host uh, ocean-going research vessels. Uh, this is a NOAA fisheries vessel called the Bell Shimada. It visited us uh, two times uh, last year, as well as Falcor, which is the new Google. With Schmidt Ocean Institute ship and um, and other ships that come uh, uh, because we have a deep water right off of our pier, but it's also opportunity for people to see the process of research because these ships they they go out and they come into the exploratorium. Their scientists come in and give talks, but we also track them when they're out. They uh, many of them have streaming a uh, streaming video, and this uh, this ship is a NOAA ship, and one of the first partnerships that we established before we moved was an educational partnership with NOAA, the Ocean and Atmospheric Administration. This is Jane Lubchenco, who was the Obama's pick for the uh, director of NOAA um, in front of one of their ships down by the waterfront um, announcing our um, partnership with them. And I'd say that NOAA has been really instrumental in helping us to uh, uh, both uh, kind of understand our new location, because it's the ocean and the atmosphere, uh, as well as, as provided us with um, some advice that we've really needed uh, along the way. Um, I, could, uh, I could probably talk for a very long time about our, all of our wonderful collaborations. I don't really have enough time. This is a, a listing of some of them. But I thought instead of sort of talking about each one, that I'd tell you a little bit about how we collaborate with scientists. So um, we don't... Uh, just use scientists, institutions, um, engineers as advisors. We actually invite them in to spend time with us and to, to collaborate. Um, when we establish the, this idea of the wire pier, which is about putting instruments on the roof and in the water and gathering, gathering data to learn about our environment and then inviting the public in a sort of open laboratory to participate in that, we knew that we didn't have the chops to uh, understand it. So, uh, so we sought their advice early on in these wire pier summits where we had scientists from NOAA, Berkeley, you know, our local San Francisco, people who know San Francisco Bay to suggest what instruments we should put in. And in some cases, they, we invited them to put their own instruments in and just provide us with the data. Um, we were really interested in real-time data and data over time to, to really understand. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, s some of the scientists, like NOAA scientists, we could embed them for um, four to six weeks in the museum, and they trained our staff, and they helped us, um, you know, build programs and and do public programs. Um, but we also work with scientists sort of remotely, you know, through through our connections. Um, so it's largely a volunteer effort uh, on their part, um, and something that we really appreciate. And of course, we've also gotten funding and support. <coughs> Um, the scenic is, is one of our uh, supporters, as well as the um, Wire Pier has largely been funded by a grant from Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Moore was mentioned earlier, and so I'm jumping on the bandwagon. 
Um, so on uh, behalf of the museum, I want to thank our partners, past, present, and future. Many of you may be in the room. Um, for having seen the potential of what we're doing and sort of helping us achieve the potential where, you know, we really see this as a platform for development. And so I'm going to turn that over to my colleague, Ron Hipschman. He's going to talk a little bit more about the data and instruments and networking. So we have been collecting for the last several years a series of sensors that we wanted to put up because <clears throat> we really believe that it's, when we talk to the public, one of the things we really want to talk about is a lot of this is about data, 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 that, that we can, once we collect all that data, then we can start looking at it and learning from it. And so we first have to start collecting it. And so uh, one of the things we started to do was put sensors. We now have a pad up on our roof of the observatory. I think I have a shot later here that shows the observatory. You can see we have a nice scenic place for sensors too. It's, uh, we'll have some cameras up there uh, eventually as well that we'll, uh, people will be able to access. Uh, but I'll, here's the observatory and uh, you can see sort of the uh, sensors peeking over the corner of the observatory up there. Uh, again, you can see a little bit of the city view there. We have a nice view of the Transamerica Pyramid, which, by the way, is where the coast used to be. Um, it didn't actually all come out all the way to the Embarcadero. Uh, and we also have inside the observatory uh, a hyperwall, a high resolution uh, data display that we can use to display some of this data. Super high, re unfortunately, this is only 1920 by 1080 on this screen, but this particular uh, thing, when we show it on our hyperwall, where it's, where it's about where three screens by three screens, all at full resolution, comes out just. It's gorgeous. It's just amazing just to look at. And we have a lot of these simulations that, and visualizations that we can show in the observatory. Uh, and that we leave those right now running in a loop, but we also come, I will go up and, for instance, into the observatory and do this as a mediated experience as well, so we can actually talk. But even without me standing back and listening to people, people will look at these things and just start discussing them. Um, we put a binder out there with some information about each uh, visualization. Uh, as an example, if we're doing uh, solar data, we might put up on the nine screens, use uh, uh, four of them for a large uh, presentation of maybe something live that's happening and use the other five screens to contextualize that, uh, that uh, main visualization. Uh, here's another example just recently. We've kind of put together a sort of a tiger team where if something's happening, we don't necessarily plan all these things uh, in advance. Uh, the person you see down there, Lori Lambertson, who's in our teacher institute, said, hey, you know, the Mavericks is happening today. We couldn't plan this in advance because nobody knows about it until 48 hours ahead of time. Um, but let's show people how we use data to determine when Mavericks is going to be. So we have a live web, a live uh, broadcast coming from Mavericks of the actual contest, and we surrounded it with screens about the data that uh, people use to uh, decide when Mavericks is actually going to happen and how they do that. So we can do these things really quick, too. It's a kind of quick turnaround thing. Uh, here is another uh, one we did with the... Uh, uh, took the live webcast, and I think this one's Mary on board the Thomas Thompson. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mary was out on that ship, and uh, we did several uh, scheduled webcasts, but we could then surround Mary with uh, data screens. Uh, they were actually broadcasting three streams of uh, live HD data, um, and we were doing this multicast. Uh, and uh, we could uh, surround Mary with not just her talking head, but also some of the cams from the ROVs under the water and uh, uh, the map of where the ship was and some other data that was coming from their control room. So using this uh, nine screen video wall has been uh, really exciting for us. So sensors, sensors, sensors. We, uh, I was told you I was going to tell you a little bit about those. I mean, we have all the usual sensors you would expect for weather, wind speed and direction, temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, uh, rainfall. Uh, this one's really interesting. This is a kind of a rainfall meter called a distrometer. It had, puts a little laser beam of uh, light, and as drops fall through it, it can measure speed and size of drops, which means we can get, really get an interesting characterization of what kind of uh, uh, water is in the air, and we actually have another exhibit uh, that's out in our outdoor area that 
we've taken data from this and we can simulate different kinds of rainstorms. So the kids stand out there and get totally soaked underneath different kinds of rainstorms, whether it be drizzle or downpour. So uh, uh, we can actually take some of this data and use it uh, in a physical sort of way. So we're also looking at solar radiation, which is very important to us because the new exploratorium, Exploratorium 2.0, is um, uh, very uh, uh, environmental building. It's a very sustainable building. We have uh, 1.3 megawatts of solar panels on our roof and we hope to be net zero. We're, at, we're still studying the whole situation. We're learning how to be net zero. We'll be one of the largest net zero museums. We probably already are the largest net zero museum in the world, but uh, uh, solar radiation is part of that. Uh, we need to know how many kilowatts per uh, square meter is falling on the building. Uh, visibility, this is in partnership with NOAA ports. We, we just put this in. We're not actually even getting data from this yet, but very soon, hopefully. This will, uh, one of the few weather things we get at the Exploratorium is fog. And so visibility is kind of a nice, important data point for us. Um, uh, actually, this is not installed yet, but it's something I hope to do in the very near future is to put an all-sky camera up so we can get an idea of cloud coverage and uh, a look at the winds aloft because clouds don't necessarily move all in the same direction and it's kind of surprising to learn that layers of air are moving in different directions. So this can show that. Uh, and we're also in partnership with Earth Networks, aka Weatherbug, and a uh, study called the Boundary Layer Network. Uh, the boundary layer is, uh, you know, where the clouds sit. And they need to, that's a very important thing uh, to know and to do that we've put on the roof uh, another weather station that they happen to own. They need a weather station too. So we have two weather stations. And I'm going to talk to tomorrow with another company who wants to put one of their weather stations on our roof. So we might have three. Uh, that may be overkill, but we can cross-check all the data that way. It's kind of nice. Uh, what well, we put a radiometer from the boundary layer network on our roof. And then this is the kind of instrument that we do in cooperation with people because we can't afford them. Um, it's a quarter million dollar instrument. So there's no way we would be able to have one of these unless we were doing it in uh, cooperation and uh, collaboration with uh, the uh, Earth networks. This is a really interesting uh, instrument. It, it's, no, it's not a mailbox. Inside of it's actually quite complex. But what this can do is give us uh, uh, contours up through the atmosphere up to 10 kilometers of temperature, water content, and humidity, which is normally done by balloon. You know, you send up a little sond up on a balloon, but we can't afford to do that because that's like $500 every time you do that. And they only do it twice a day at noon and midnight uh, 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 Greenwich time. Uh, so we only get two data points a day for that. This does it every six minutes. So. Uh, kind of cool. You get uh, these contours up through the atmosphere. And if you do the take these, this is just one reading, lay them side by side, you can get kind of a time series and watch the, the clouds and the humidity move over you as it uh, happens through the day. So this is just one, three days worth of data here. And you can see a big uh, uh, front kind of moved in there, uh, just as an example. We're also working in uh, uh, partnership with Berkeley uh, Sonoma Technologies and NOAA Air Resources Lab uh, to measure air quality. And these instruments aren't up quite yet. We're working on that very soon. We'll be measuring various atmospheric gases, uh, mon carbon monoxide, CO2, the nitrogen oxides, oxygen. And we're going to look at particulates. We're not quite sure we can do that. Um, that's a program over in Berkeley called Beacon, and they are trying to do a dense network of uh, monitoring atmospheric gases where they're putting these things only like a kilometer apart. Uh, and uh, we convinced them to put one over on our side of the bay as well. <clears throat> we also have uh, a buoy from the Pacific uh, Marine Environmental Lab up, uh, up the coast a bit. <clears throat> They've loaned us a buoy that measures dissolved CO2 and atmospheric CO2. So we're seeing what trends we see in an urban environment from that. Uh, here's the kind of things you see from dissolved oxygen and dissolved CO2. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have a group of water instruments uh, that down in these tubes in the water in the bay. And we're monitoring a whole raft of uh, uh, things from the bay, uh, including some kind of new sensors that uh, uh, just have been uh, released uh, that can measure crude oil <coughs> and uh, uh, pollution from optical brighteners and things like that. So we have lots of things in the water as well. 
Uh, last, uh, we have a radar sensor on board on top of Pier 15. You can see the antenna up there. And we're measuring surface currents in the bay, and that's in cooperation uh, and collaboration with San Francisco State University uh, Romberg Tiburon Center. And we have a real uh, great guy who's helping us with the water sensors from there too, uh, Chris Raleigh. Uh, all that stuff goes into this, into data loggers, various data loggers is just one of them. And uh, of course we get all of our nice comma delimited data from that. And now well, we do have some uh, uh, future sensors that we also can't afford, uh, but uh, hope to put up in the near future uh, if we can find some good collaborators for that. Um, these are the kind of things we want to do in the future. We have, uh, uh, the observatory is actually ready for a heliostat because we want to look at solar weather. It's very important to look at uh, solar uh, uh, space weather. And so we want to put a heliostat up there and take a look at the images of the sun in uh, visible ultra, uh, uh, hydrogen and, and maybe even calcium ultraviolet light and th then all these other instruments as well. Uh, I want to turn it over to Rob Raffarb, who's our, uh, one of our data wranglers, visualizers, and he's going to tell you a little bit about how we handle that data and what we're going to do with it. Thanks, Ron. Um, <coughs> so as Ron mentioned, we're building um, um, sort of a deep, a deep dive network for ourselves at our location, and a variety of different types of sensors, atmospheric, um, in the water, um, and in the future also potentially uh, some seismic sensors. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing once we get the data, and how, we, how we're thinking about using it um, in our own setting and in a public setting, and to share it with others. So um, for the wired peer, um, we are thinking that we're actually creating a data platform. And this is something that's new for us. We have experience with publishing our website for many years, distributing live video streams. Um, but the idea of working with data sets that we keep up to date, keep current, and make, avail make available to a large audience is relatively new for us. So it's something that we're learning as we go. Um, we've talked about um, the aspect of it that has to do with acquisition of the data, the sensors and data loggers um, that, that Ron talked about, as well as talking to some that are in the cloud that we can communicate with that are relative to our location. Um, the next part of that has to do with uh, some of the processing that we have to do to the data um, to make it usable um, and, and, and a place to store it so that we can uh, get to it with regular access. Um, the last part of the platform that we're thinking about is uh, to enable um, exhibit developers, teachers, and uh, uh, explainers in our, in our museum setting, as well as to interact with the public and, and research communities to share our data and to let them um, create their own narratives of what's going on. Um, this is just a conceptual diagram that sort of breaks those three parts of acquisition processing and storage and museum and public access into these three components. Uh, we take advantage of standard um, uh, servers, operating systems, um, sort of best of breed tools to uh, take care of the data and uh, definitely rely on partners like Scenic to um, help uh, with the co connectivity to our data and to make it more accessible in the broader community. Um, a tool that, um, that Ron and uh, colleague Steve, who was here last year talking about uh, this project as we got it off the ground, um, that they've installed is, is uh, called ERDAP. And this is a, a software service developed by NOAA that we have running on a server at this URL. So you could actually go um, today and browse some of the data sets that we have available. And, and some of the science partners that are interacting with us, uh, this is the method that they're currently using. To, uh, to get data from our site. Um, this is uh, just a screenshot of what the ERDAP platform looks like. Uh, um, it's kind of hardcore. You have to, uh, you have to be patient and uh, find your way around it, but uh, it's quite flexible. And of course, you can get raw data out of the system as well in different formats. Um, so what we have plans to do next is to um, utilize some of the techniques uh, for storytelling on the web that we've done to uh, create additional context around the data, explain what we're gathering, why we're gathering it, how we do it, to illuminate that process, and then to allow people to play with the data sets in an interactive way using state-of-the-art web techniques. Um, so uh, what's coming next is a data explorer website where we'll expand the access 
that we're uh, uh, creating so that more people um, in different settings can interact with our data. This is a prototype of a tool that our colleague Steve has made um, that lets you explore different data sets um, uh, very easily by dragging and dropping from this list at the left side um, and then plotting them in different ways for, for comparison. Um, the Exploratorium, as, as a learning lab about learning, um, has a, a, a fundamental um, aspect where, where we incorporate our teaching community in understanding phenomena and in communicating with the public about what we're learning and what we're observing. And so um, an early uh, experiment that's going on right now has been to work with our uh, Teacher Institute, which is one of our professional development for teachers, science and math teachers um, uh, from uh, middle school, junior high, and, and, uh, and senior, to uh, work with some of the data that we're gathering on site and to um, incorporate that into the uh, teacher workshops that they do. So to date, they've done three, one about the carbon cycle, one about understanding data um, in San Francisco Bay, and another one that focuses on visualizations. And um, these, um, workshops have, are, are, are starting to provide good information for us about how we can engage people with data. Um, this is a quote from uh, Lori, um, who was mentioned earlier, one of our Teacher Institute teachers, um, talking about how the next generation science standards track very closely um, to the kinds of activities that we do in these workshops, where teachers are asked to design an experiment, conduct an experiment, gather data, analyze data, and then present the data and their experiment results. So we take them through these activities, and this tracks to those standards that they would then do in their classrooms with students. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. We're really honored to accept this award. Um, thank you, Scenic, and thanks to the community for listening to us today. If you have any questions, Mary and Ron, can at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, we actually have a wired gear, and uh, I know that um, okay. our marine biology faculty would are <coughs> be really excited about this. How would they go about um, joining, and is it are, are they able to join? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as uh, collaboration, uh, oh. Um, uh, he w uh, the gentleman here was talking about at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, there's a group that also has sensors on a pier collecting data. Actually, um, the uh, Exploratorium is part of a network called Sencus, which is an ocean observing uh, system. And um, one of our colleagues is from Cal Poly and may already be connected, but if not, just send them our way. We're more than happy because one of the things we think is that we're studying our local landscape in San Francisco Bay, but we want to connect with other observing networks like the Ocean Observing Network off the coast of, of Oregon and Washington that's being put in, the cable observatory that's being uh, put in there, and then the data is routed through scripts, as well as other observing networks in Hawaii, uh, in Seattle, and in Southern California as well. So we want people to be able to start at San Francisco, but then kind of virtually travel to all these other observing networks and compare the data from them. So, Thank you. yeah, my, my email address is up there. Very good. Yes? So you've mentioned that you were going to think about presenting this information to a variety of people. You know, I'm assuming the people in their homes where their kids can look at it. Has that got, where's that at and where are your future plans for do you mean the data itself? The data or just the interactive videos? I guess what was your plan for expanding kind of the access to this? Um, we'll, we are going to um, work on the Data Explorer website to make, um, to add more context around the data that we're collecting at the pier and to be able to share that and to give people some tools to experiment with it. We'll also create some um, stories around the data as, as we're actively investigating interesting phenomena that appear and talk about that online um, so that people can access it through our website as well as by coming to the museum. And um, the, the it, it, it's kind of exciting for us to think about putting data out there and to, to, to be a steward of, of the data that people can then use in, in some invest investigation themselves. 
So there's quite a lot of open data sources at the state level and federal level um, and uh, different agencies. So we're um, learning from those examples so that we can understand how to present it so that people have a way into it and have a sense of what they might do with it. But we definitely would be encouraging it. We've talked about doing things like hackathons that we might host or other ways to sort of wrangle with the data in a hands-on way. One of the things I've been playing with also is uh, uh, a way to allow people to take their own data, uh, a way to buy an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi and hook sensors up to that and give you a chance to collect your own data wherever you are. Um, so writing up all that kind of uh, how that works and how to put these things together uh, is kind of a, an exciting thing for me anyway. So we're seeing where, that gonna, where that's going to go as well. I think it's the idea is to use these these tools that are out there, expand them a little, and sort of um, work through a citizen science model, but have it not just be working with our data, but collecting your own data and contributing it and being a, a measure, you know, measuring and observing yourself. So those are all future opportunities. As I said we're sort of this is a platform for enormous development, and we're you know we're really excited and and looking forward to you know a lot of years of figuring this stuff out. We just need to split ourselves into three parts to get it all done. <laughs> get some more funding. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, I just have one. It's kind of a curious, kind of a curiosity about uh, Noah's interest in that radiometer. I thought that was really neat because the Oakland sound man uh, has been there and been placed for years and years and years. And it's got to be an ongoing cost, like you mentioned, to them. I'm wondering, is there any, are they intended or intending to I think the Oakland sounding, which is the balloon, the balloon so oh, uh, is the radiometer going to be used uh, in association with the Oakland soundings? I, I suspect it can be, but they're totally separate. Uh, the soundings are done with, again, the, with the balloon twice a day. Uh, by, the, and I, by the National Weather Service. National Weather Service. And I think that will, of course, continue because you want that nice, consistent set of data. And, of course, Earth Networks has to monetize that uh, radiometer somehow, so they will be selling that data to various groups. Uh, we, just ha we just get access to the data because they're using our power and our data and our real estate. So, uh, but uh, we can work with any group we want with that data as well. So there's, there's, there'll be dozens of those radiometers all, over, all through the state. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.